So I want to talk about the, equ the equivalence principle. So the equivalence principle is kind of how, um, how speaking about re uh, special relativity, how we took as the most basic postulate that the speed of the, uh, sorry, the, the speed of light is the same in all reference frames. That was kind of our single most guiding principle. This is the same thing to general relativity. The equivalence principle is the most important observation we can make about the universe where all the rest of our, you know, applications will fall in line. And what this says is, is something really interesting. It's, it's kind of what we just talked about, about, you know, being on a plane. But more specifically in this case, we can imagine um, a gigantic space elevator here. And, you know, it doesn't matter whether there's a rope tugging it up or whether it's, you know, propulsion driven or if there's even a, you know, space elevator shaft there at all. Um, it really makes no difference because all that matters is, and actually, by the way, um, yeah, we'll, we'll do this iteratively here. So we have a, the, the thing that matters most here is that this elevator that we're going to ride in is completely opaque, meaning that the walls, the ceilings, the floor are entirely made of lead. We can't see out. And now let's say that we happen to get on this elevator here. And for the first, we'll say, five minutes of the ride, uh, whatever it might be, we accelerate for uh, upwards. So what I want to do here is compare... Or, or, or just consider, think about what the person inside this elevator would say is happening to themselves. So if we, if we imagine a normal case where you just get a normal elevator here on Earth, and, you know, typically that accelerating period is only a matter of like five seconds or something like that. You know, you get on this elevator, it is closed. You, typically, unless it's a glass elevator, you can't see outside. And so there's about five seconds where you feel like, you know, you feel a little heavier than normal. And that's because... Not only is gravity pulling you down, but in order to accelerate you upwards, the floor has to push up on you. So specifically, the floor pushing up on you, creating a constant acceleration, to you feels like there's a little bit of extra gravity. Does that kind of make sense? So, and, and again, um, if you're coming to the end of a ride, by the way, if you're, you know, towards the end of the motion, as you begin decelerating upwards, you feel the opposite. The floor pushes up a little bit less heavily. Um, and we'll come back to that in a moment. But let's consider this case now, you know, so usually it's only about a matter of three seconds where we might feel 20% heavier than normal. Now, let's, let's consider a really strange situation here. Let's say that the person who's on this elevator has, for whatever, their, whatever reason, they've never spent a moment of their life actually standing on the surface of this planet. So this may not necessarily be Earth. This is uh, some other alien creature that comes by. They, their spaceship just like throws them out. They land in the elevator, and they immediately begin accelerating upwards. So bizarre situation. But the important thing is that this person in here no longer knows what it feels like to stand on that planet. So for us, when we get on, on an elevator, we know how much weight it normally we have. We know how much force we usually have to, to push with our feet to counteract gravity. This person has no clue what the normal amount of gravitational force is for them. But what they're going to do is they're going to get on the elevator. And without any delay, it's immediately going to begin accelerating. And we, I do want to say it's accelerating up uniformly. So if it's accelerating up at one meter per second squared, that doesn't change, basically. And now, what we're going to say is, or, or we're going to ask them, what's happening? So what would they say is happening? They, so they've never stood on the planet. They, they, get shift, they get shipped there. Maybe they've had a blindfold on the whole time. They have no idea what's occurring to them. Until they finally take that blindfold off, they see there's a big box around them. It's not moving, at least relative to them. But what they feel is they're being pushed to the floor. So let me ask you this. How is what they're feeling 
on an upward accelerating elevator, how is what they're feeling any different than what I'm feeling not accelerating, but strictly just due to a gravitational force? The only difference between us would be, I might say that I'm experiencing a, a, a force of 750 newtons here. This person, even if they had the same mass, they might say they're experiencing a, a gravitational force of 850 newtons. So the, the, the amount of force might be different, but to us both, the best we can say, because we're in essentially a closed box, is that there is a force pulling us downwards that in order to stand upright, we have to counteract. And you can measure that force. It doesn't change. So to them, what's occurring to them is not just the planet pulling down, but it's the extra amount of force required to accelerate them up. So if they were to, for example, measure the force acting on them, to them, it would feel like they're standing on a planet with a little more gravitational force than any normal person on the planet would, would um, be experiencing, but they literally would not know the difference. They would simply say they're standing on the surface of a planet with a slightly higher value of G than, than what they really should be using, if that makes sense. So they experience that extra upwards accelerating force no differently than they would experience a stronger gravitational force. And here's the kicker. If we remove the planet entirely, so there is no more gravitational force whatsoever, but if we make this a rocket-propelled elevator that just literally goes, it, it's, or I guess we call this a rocket. <laughs> it literally just accelerates through space. Um, now, up doesn't matter because there's no planet to, to reference it by. So in whatever direction, we now just simply have some object that's accelerating in a certain direction. Uniformly is the key. And now let's be a little bit more specific about this. Let's say the acceleration of this object is 9.81 meters per second squared. So we're getting a little more specific in our kind of, you know, thought experiment. But if you put one of us, um, for whatever reason, you take us off of Earth and you place us in this elevator and then you wake us up. So we've been transported inside this elevator. This elevator is accelerating upwards. We can't see out. It doesn't really matter. But there's no gravitational force. What would we say is happening? And the answer is, for us getting on that elevator, accelerating up at that rate, it would be zero difference from me right now. And not only would it feel the same, there would be literally no way to possibly tell whether that upwards force is from gravity or from an accelerated reference frame. And that's the key. The equivalence principle says that accelerated reference frames are mathematically and physically indistinguishable from gravitational forces. The accelerated reference frame behaves indistinguishably from a gravitational field. And that's where general relativity now comes in. So this is really important, and I, I think this is maybe even a more brilliant insight than, than special relativity in the first place, just saying that time, time changes and space changes. What he is now able to do, and this is just, if, if you spend another five years in, you know, theoretical math and um, um, uh, uh, differential geometry and whatnot, the language of, of general relativity is literally about three or four steps higher than that of special relativity. So it's not something you can just approach after taking a special relativity class. But, and, and this is really cool because Einstein literally just taught himself all of this so that he could write these laws. But the actual, like, almost magical realization that he made was that to, descri to describe gravitational fields, all he has to take are the reference frames that he already knows how to deal with in special relativity. With one difference. Everything we considered in special relativity was what's considered an inertial reference frame. And by, by definition, that means a reference frame that's moving at a constant velocity relative to another. 
So he already knew how to deal with reference frames that were moving at a constant velocity. And the idea was that we've treated everything according to differential elements. So you have a dx, dy, dz, you have a dt, you can turn it into a uh, velocity, dx over dt and so on, dx prime over dt prime. He, knows ex he knew exactly how to transform all of these things to see what would happen if you have a reference frame whose second derivative was not zero. So you integrate, you integrate Lorentz factors for increasingly high values of gamma is how you essentially boost from zero velocity and accelerate forwards. That's exactly what you end up doing mathematically. And his realization now is we're going to take the same effects we've already encountered, which are time dilation, length contraction, and we're going to transform them according to the laws of special relativity to see how general relativity or gravity will somehow encompass those same effects. We're going to mimic gravity by changing coordinate systems uniformly, and magically we get out a whole theory of gravity. It, it, it's really incredible. So here's the, all, all I want to talk about here from, from here on is a couple, the two most important effects of general relativity, and we'll bring it back to the idea of the, uh, the, um, geez, the twin paradox.